Hey, Brother Matt here. Happy to be with you all tonight, continuing our discussion, uh, our Bible study of Christmas. And um, tonight we're going to kind of approach this topic from a slightly different angle, uh, partly, I guess, inspired or I guess confirmed um, by uh, Sunday night and I think maybe even Sunday morning, uh, what, what Brother Ernie was talking about in terms of uh, Christmas and uh, alongside trusting God's word. Um, and I, I hope that this is a blessing uh, to you. This is more of a, a Bible study. So I, I always get this confused. I, I, I tell the, the adult Sunday school class this all the time that I, I, have, <laughs> I have trouble uh, distinguishing or making the difference between a sermon and a, and a Bible study. I just kind of mesh it all together and just put the gospel in there. So I'm probably going to do that tonight. But um, uh, I, I, I've kind of broken down this topic into, I guess, more of a study approach. So I, I hope that's a blessing to you. But let, let's pray before we start. Uh, Father God, we thank you for sending your son to, to the earth. I thank you, O oh God, that you were born... Um, to a virgin, that you were uh, born in, in a manger. God, I thank you for all that this story has to tell us about who you are. I pray, O oh God, that as we open up your word tonight, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us in a greater way tonight by the power of your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in terms of trusting God's word? Like how, how should we trust God's word when it comes to specifically um, the, the birth of Jesus? Uh, this is probably, you know, in, in thinking about this, <laughs> my favorite holiday, just to be clear, is not Christmas. My favorite holiday is probably Thanksgiving. Uh, I think it's everything that Christmas is uh, minus the, the the headache of gifts or stress of gifts, I, I guess you could say. It's family, it's good food. I mean, I really enjoy Thanksgiving. It's my favorite ho holiday. But I, I think, I guess you could say theologically, um, I really enjoy uh, the Christmas story. And I feel like there are some really powerful like truths in there. And I understand that this, the, the center of the Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, but I think that there's something really amazing about the incarnation. Um, and so we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit. And uh, I just want to go over three uh, tips, whatever, whatever you want to call them, three principles uh, to help us better trust God's word when it comes to, to, to the birth of Christ. Now, these are not merely uh, apologetics necessarily, ap apologetical principles, um, but I, I, I trust that these are just general things that we can, I guess, apply to, to pretty much all of Scripture. Um, and <clears throat> the first point, uh, to be clear, uh, is that the, the story of the birth of Jesus Christ is rooted in history. And that is, that is an amazing point that we can't gloss over. And especially as someone who's, who's grown up in church, I know that I have the tendency to, to, to just know, well, these are just facts that I was taught from, from, from an early age. And okay, Jesus was born, you know, 2000 years ago. And, and I know all the details of, of the Christmas story, but I, I take for granted sometimes the fact that, that God, the God of all existence, uh, was, was born, uh, that he took on human flesh, uh, in, in one of the most amazing ways, in a moment in history, um, and and that is that is super uh, special. Um, <clears throat> and you know what? Uh, well, let's just dive in here. We're going to take a look at. Uh, we're going to start with Luke chapter one, um, and I'll just uh, put up the scripture on the screen for you. Luke chapter one, uh, uh, starting with verse one. Uh, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, we're, uh, we're going to take a look at Acts also, the beginning of Acts, just so you see from, I guess, a literary standpoint of how similar this is. Uh, most scholars believe that, that Luke is also the, the writer of, of Acts. And let's take a look at Acts chapter 1 here. In Acts chapter 1, 
starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then he goes into to more details. Now, just for a second, just take a, a, a brief look at the similarities between Luke 1 and Acts 1. Um, now, again, Luke, uh, who was um, apparently a, a doctor, wrote both of, of these books, um, from what we can tell. And you, you notice that, well, one, he's writing to most excellent Theophilus. And why is that significant? Well, even the, the, the way that he writes most excellent Theophilus kind of suggests that Theophilus was probably some Someone who was a respected individual. Maybe he was someone who was uh, who had a lot of political clout, um, or or maybe he was someone who was who was wealthy or well known, um, and that is significant because. Uh, <laughs> Luke wasn't just uh, telling these stories to his friends; he was uh, doing his research to collect information to make. Um, to, to make the, the, the gospel in, in, in Luke and the information in Acts very clear and orderly, as he says, um, so that th- this truth is made plain. Like he, Luke is basically saying, hey, I'm, I'm just giving you the facts here. Um, and that's, uh, again, uh, uh, one, one reason we can trust uh, the veracity of the story of Jesus being born is that it's rooted in history. These are not just like, and, and I, I think that's an important point to make again, because you know the, the the world today. When when you mention the gospel, when you mention Jesus, they just immediately gravitate to these ideas of who they think Jesus is. These ideas of what they think the Bible says, um, and the reality is these are events that were carefully uh, researched by the people that were living in the time uh, of of Jesus's uh, earthly ministry. Right? Um, it, uh, just recently, about a week or two ago. We had my my aunt over, and uh, she noticed I, I I wear this this bracelet. And just to to be clear, I I I do enjoy that. There's this uh, podcast called uh, Cultish. I don't know if you can see my bracelet here, but it says uh, "Bad theology kills people." And I I don't really necessarily like that statement. Um, but I in any case, it's a Christian podcast where they uh, they they research different. Um, Different different cult people who've been saved from from different cults. It's it's and it's interesting, and I partly wear this because it's it's a conversation starter. And sure enough, my aunt noticed that I was wearing this bracelet, and she said, "What what you know what what does your bracelet say?" And we got into this conversation, and she started talking about Scientology, and and I had a really great you know opportunity. We had this discussion about how the the fact that that Christianity is unique. Um, compared to all faiths that exist because Christianity is rooted in history. And, and one of my, my favorite quotes um, from, from Vody uh, Bachman, if you've never heard of him, he's, he's a, a great uh, pastor and uh, an author. And he, he, he says, uh, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of, of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And I think that's just a great summary of, of what God's word is and what, what the gospels really uh, purport to, to, to say is true. And um, so again, our first point is that the, the birth of Jesus, it's rooted in history and we really can't take that for granted um, you're, you're typical, and we were talking about Scientology for a little bit, like your typical Scientologist, it's like, it, it's like spiritual comic books. It's, it's really, it's, it's sad, um, you know, for, especially for people who, who've grown up in, in, in these, uh, in these cults, um, they, they really don't un- understand this, but you know, we, we have these accounts that are again, rooted in history, rooted in, in like real history. These are people who didn't just like, oh, I'm, I'm excited about this person, Jesus. Let me just make up these stories. No, these are people who talk to other eyewitnesses, um, about the fact that Jesus, God came down into history in in an event that is something you would never make up and and we're we're going to get to that in the second point but really quick um 
in talking about these prophecies that were fulfilled, uh, again, uh, Brother Ernie kind of talked about this a little bit on Sunday night. I just want to give you a couple, um, just really quick. I'm not going to turn to them. Um, you can just <laughs> listen to me uh, say them, and you've probably heard heard these prophecies before, specifically fulfilled by Jesus. Uh, this is Isaiah 7. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, in Micah 5, 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Uh, also in, in Genesis uh, 49, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And also in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, these are just you know a, a couple that, that I picked. There are tons of, of prophecies that were specifically fulfilled through Jesus, not, not by some theological you know, connect the dots, but by the reality of who Jesus is in the, the time that he was born and uh, the events of, of his birth and his life, his death and resurrection. Um, so let, let, again, the, the first point to be very clear, the Christmas story, it is deeply rooted in history. Our second point, uh, the criterion of embarrassment. You usually hear this brought up with, uh, with, with, the resurrection um, and with the gospel accounts, uh, the criterion of, of embarrassment, it is, uh, I guess you could say, a historical tool that, that's, or a tool that's used to assess historical narratives, basically. And uh, the, the criterion of, of embarrassment basically says that if there's something that's embarrassing that's in a, a narrative, it actually lends credence to the fact that this, this may be true. Um, so, uh, specifically, how you know how, the, how does the criterion of embarrassment? How does that uh, apply to the Christmas story? Well, most of us know know the know the details here, but I'm just going to read just a couple points that that I wrote down here. Uh, if you wanted to <laughs> to invent a narrative about the birth of a Messiah uh, who would save the world, you would never you would never do uh, a couple of, of these following. And and let me just be very clear here. Uh, Cole, my, my my son, he's uh, getting getting into superheroes. And uh, it's fun to kind of explain to him. And I remember doing this with, with Jesse too, explaining. And Jesse would always, he would like, whenever he would see me, I, there was some age where he would always ask me like, what does this superhero do? And what what can this superhero uh, do? And, um, you know, I, I'm not by no means like a comic book nerd or anything, but I, you know, I enjoy superheroes. And so I, I would explain this. And now I'm starting to explain this to Cole. And what's interesting is, you know, I could tell you, I'm explaining to Cole how strong Superman is and how fast the Flash is. Um, and, and explaining about all these details about all these superheroes. And we see the opposite in, in, in the story and specifically in the birth of Jesus. This is not something that someone would deliberately make up, okay? Especially to the audience of of Jews at the time, right? So if you wanted to invent a narrative about uh, about the Messiah being born 2,000 years ago, you would never deliberately choose to have your Messiah born out of wedlock to save a people with strict marital laws, okay? That's one. Two, uh, you, you would never choose to have the the coming of your messiah heralded by shepherds by shepherds specifically who are some of the lowest uh, in socioeconomic class of the time okay three uh, you would never never have this foreseen by foreigners by the wise men from a distant land rather than the devoutly religious people who were already looking for their messiah Right? Like, what, wouldn't you, if you wanted uh, the Jews at the time to believe, like, hey, the Messiah is here, like, wouldn't you, you know, you know wouldn't you have uh, this be revealed to, I don't know, the Pharisees of the time who were maybe looking and longing for a Messiah? Um, and, and just one, one more point, you would never have your Messiah born and placed 
into a, a, an animal's feeding trough to save a people with strict cleanliness laws, especially regarding animals and food. Now, these are just a couple points where uh, that, again, lend... I guess a sense of in, in that 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 would go into the topic of uh, the criterion of embarrassment. But for all of these reasons, that you would never like this is not something that you would use to uh, to again to to give credit to your story. Um, and and this is in the similar uh, in in a similar way we use the criterion of embarrassment for uh, resurrection uh, stories in the Gospels. You know um, whether that's the 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 women being the, some of the first people to to come to the empty tomb. Uh, you know w- women who at the t- at the time two thousand years ago would not their their word would not be held up in in a court of law. So um, again we talk about that a lot with the resurrection, but I think that's important to to make this point that. Even in the, the the Christmas story, there are facts here that um, that you would not make up if you were trying to make up this story. Okay, um, so with the in in the birth of, of 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 Jesus, we we have something that's deeply rooted in history. We have uh, specific details of the story that would not that would not be made up. And and I should have I should have made this more clear at the beginning, but all of those things. They don't matter. <laughs> I did, I'm sorry. That, the, well, brother Matt, you just wasted you know the first 15 minutes. You know, and now you're saying it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter to a certain extent. But this this last point I think is is the most in, important part, um, and that is the fact that God's Spirit needs to make these truths alive to us. And I've been thinking about this, and again, part of the reason I guess. I'm sharing this now, and uh, what Brother Ernie was kind of talking about on on uh, Sunday and Sunday night um, is in terms of trusting God's word. Um, and I'm just just in there's something that I've been praying about for you know a couple of weeks. God, help me to trust your word more. Help me to trust your word more. Um, and you know, to a certain degree, I think there's a part of me that wants to that's really asking God. Help me to feel like I trust your word more. Um, and I think when, when, you, when you really break that down, I, I think what God's Spirit is really doing uh, in me is asking, Lord, take these things that I know in my head and make them real in my heart and with the way I live my life. Uh, and and I, that's not easy. To do, and again, probably because I'm speaking to a lot of people who have been, uh, who who've grown up in church or have been attending church for for a long time. This is a uh, the reality of you know one of the elements of walking in the spirit. I believe, which is I I, I know that I know the facts and the details of the Christmas story, but I, I need God's spirit to make that alive in me. I need God's spirit to 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 help me to see the gospel in that and to let that change the way that I live and not not change the way that I live um not just so that I can uh <laughs> giving away a little bit of Max and his monkey uh the Christmas uh story coming up uh not just so that I can earn <laughs> good points with God or with Santa or whatever um, but no, I, I want I want the Holy Spirit to make these things real to me so that I actually trust God more in my obedience to his word. Um, and so, again, this is just our, our, our last point uh, to be very clear. And one of the reasons why I just, I love the Christmas story is because it tells us so much about who God is. Think about it. And I... Uh, this is going to sound weird, but I've been, maybe I mentioned this last time too. Oh, this is kind of weird now that I think about it. But I've been looking at the stars more. And Cole has been uh, fascinated with planets now. And he ask him, ask him a, how far the, or how many Earths can fit in the sun. And he, you know, he's, he's learning all these different facts. Uh, and uh, to a certain degree, Cole, uh, Cole has, knows a lot of facts about our solar system, right? About the universe. But does he really understand that, what is it, a million Earths can fit inside the sun? 
Now, you know that, that fact, and Cole understands that a million is a big number, but do you really know like, what we're saying when we, when we say that? Do we really know what it means for the God of all creation to make his grand entrance into his creation in, in the form of, of a baby? And not, not a baby that would one day sit on some glorious man-made throne, but a, a God who would, who would stretch his arms across a cross to die in my place. And thinking about what, what Brother Isaac said um, uh, last week at, at Bible study, you know, about how we should be giving our all in response to this great gift that we have in, in Jesus you know, it's, it's the least we can do. And, you know, we, we say that uh, sometimes as a, uh, as a manner of speech, you know, uh, someone does something nice for you and, you and you maybe give them a thank you card or whatever it is, and it's the least I can do. And we can just say like, well, it's the least I can do is to, is to um, lift my voice and, and worship the Lord. It's the least I can do to, to do this, to give to the Lord. Um, but Literally, that is true. <laughs> it is the absolute least we can do because our best can never be more than that to a God who is so worthy of our praise, who's, who's again, like, like we heard la- last week, and I'm just giving an amen tonight. God is, is so far, so far a- a- above us. And I- I'm just, I, what I'm trying to say is, uh, in, in this last point is, I think we can do a better job of meditating on the glory of the gospel, even at this time of remembering the birth of, of Jesus. Because again, this, this is amazing to me. And, and I also, to, to put this more in context personally, uh, is usually, you know, uh, the summer before um, Christmas time, I'm usually meditating on on the christmas story and i done had the you know the blessing of being able to do that past a uh, few years in, in writing christmas music and uh it, it always blows me away i and i maybe maybe that's why i'm very fond of of uh the incarnation is is there there are heavy truths here when you really think about it like i i just i really can't get get over this because i i would never you know, if if I wanted to look cool in front of other people, like this is this the story of of what we see and Jesus being born, it's the complete opposite. It is complete humility, but it's not just that it's humility. It's you see the vulnerability of God, who he doesn't have to be vulnerable. He doesn't have to. Uh, he doesn't have to take on fragile human flesh and live and suffer and and the the reality is this is good news you know i even just praying before starting to record this i was thanking god for who he is i'm not worthy we're not worthy of the god that we have and i i don't mean that like uh that that God is too far beyond be, beyond us necessarily, but but I'm saying that why should God exist the way that He does? We we you know we just assume that oh this is God who God is and this is who He's always been, but like how could we ever deserve so merciful, so gracious uh, of a God? And I feel like I'm on a rant already, so let me let me wrap this up and um, and just turn to, to to one other, or actually two more scripture uh, scriptures. Um, one, uh, what, and, and specifically talking about this in um, about the, I guess you can call it the the unlikelihood of this or the. Uh, the surprising nature of of the incarnation here we can uh, take a look at uh first corinthians chapter one first corinthians chapter one verse 27 uh if you're in youth group you should remember this this was some of our memory work from a couple years ago uh but god chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise god chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong 
He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Uh, The only reason that I can glory in the beauty of the incarnation is because Jesus himself, Jesus himself has made these truths, the truths of of God's word, uh, uh, true and and real to me. Um, God has revealed these things to us by the power of his spirit. It is not because you have gone to so many church services that the light bulb went in your head, light bulb went on in your head, and you, oh, I finally figured out the God equation. Oh, it finally makes logical sense to me. No, there are some people, and this is where I think, you know, to a certain degree, apologetics fall short, which is you can argue with people till you're blue in the face. And the reality is, unless God's Spirit does a transformative work in our hearts, there is no way that we can understand or appreciate the beauty of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if, if, if you're, at, you know, in this time, uh, Maybe it's, it's, it's been some time since you've really meditated on maybe some of the most basic truths in, in the Bible. If I can encourage you in something, in terms of trusting God's Word, uh, before you, you, you open up God's Word, or maybe right after, don't just read it for the sake of reading the newspaper or who, I don't know who reads the My parents read the newspapers. <laughs> I know that. But don't read God's word simply for the sake of learning facts. But let's read God's word knowing that God's word is living. It's active. It's sharper than any, any a double-edged edged sword. It's able to divide. It's able to divide these things in, in, in our hearts. And what we need to do is to ask God's Spirit to make these things alive in us. And, and I want to encourage you, especially around this Christmas time, um, if you're maybe you're struggling with trusting God's Word, uh, maybe trusting the promises of God's Word, maybe you don't feel at this time that God's been faithful, that you, you feel maybe a sense of distance uh, uh, between, between God, uh, between his, your, yourself and, and His Word, uh, can I give you some some joy, some hope here in this t- season of joy, joy and hope? It doesn't depend on you. It, it's not it's not based off of. And we we talk about this. You know, God's grace in my life isn't dependent on. Uh, it, it's not dependent on on my track record, but th- the faith that's at work in my life is not dependent on my intellect. It's not dependent on the comprehensiveness of my knowledge of Scripture. It's dependent on the Spirit of God and what He is doing in my life, what He's doing in, in our life, in, in, our, in our church, in the body of Christ, in the, in the world at large. And at least <laughs> to, to myself and hopefully to you out there, maybe we can take a, a step back and say, whoa, uh, maybe that, that'll change even the posture of our prayer uh, instead of maybe praying out of frustration at our circumstance, uh, to to make to maybe pray out of a, a a desperation, out of an urgency to know God more, to want to trust His Word more, because I I want to know I want to know Jesus, not again not in just mere factual uh, statements. I want to know and, and and let God's Word be hidden in my heart. But at the same time, I want to boldly, like we we just read, I want to boldly affirm that it is Jesus Christ in whom I am completely boasting right now at this moment as I speak, but also every believer out there, I am boasting in the power of the gospel, in the power of God's Spirit to change my heart, to make the truth of God's Word, the truth of of God entering his creation in these amazing ways 
I'm trusting in the power of God's Spirit to make those things real uh, in me. And if I could just uh, leave you with a, a quote from a Christmas song that uh, the, the choir, we, we sang this a, a couple years ago um, in talking about the, the incarnation. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, I don't even remember the name of the song, but here, here, here's the quote. I came into your darkness, skin and bones have I. Behold my hands, behold my feet, for what you mean to me. The darkness could not hide me, for even there you will find me. Your sin, your pain, your sorrow and shame, I know all, and I bore all for you. Um, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the glory of you coming down to earth in such an amazing way. O oh, Holy Spirit, I pray, O oh God, that you would make the truth of your word more real to us, O oh God. O oh, Holy Spirit, may we trust your word tonight in a greater way, not just so that we feel better, not just so that we have greater peace, but God, so that we know you in a greater way, in such a way that we're able to obey you in a greater way. Oh God, please give grace in our weakness in all of these things, whether that's understanding your word or, or trusting you. Oh God, please give us grace in all of our weaknesses. And again, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the glory of, of this gospel truth of, of you coming down to your creation, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh God, that we would live lives of worship because literally it is the least we can do in response to a holy and gracious, loving God. We thank you, O oh Lord, again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if I could uh, just leave you with this, uh, Brother Vincent uh, spoke a couple years ago at, at a Christmas service, and I'm just going to uh, play this clip that kind of uh, sums up uh, the glory of the Incarnation. God bless you. The unspeakable came to us as the Word. The unknowable became knowable. The light shined in the darkness, even though the darkness did not understand it. But it's not simply that the unfathomable God of all creation became knowable. It's that the Lord of glory willingly gave up his glory. The Son and forever existent ruler over all creation, became a baby. And in that dark night, a mother held the savior of all mankind in her arms and watched our Lord willingly choosing to take breaths through tiny lungs and cling for warmth at a mother's side. And as we sit 2,000 years later and think that Christmas is about us, our wealth, our possessions, our pride, the real question we must ask ourselves is, why us? Why me? It's the same question that Mary asked. And how can it be that the God of all creation should choose to dwell in me. Even more, what have I done with so great a gospel, so gracious a God, and so vulnerable a friend?